Um, my name is Mike Gelzer. I'm a product manager for Docker Core Runtime. Uh, I'm also one of the architects of the Docker 112 orchestration features that we announced at DockerCon, uh, which that's primarily what I'll be covering in this talk. Uh, generally speaking, the talk is about what's new in Docker 112, and um, uh, mainly it's orchestration. That was our big announcement at DockerCon. That's what we're going to release uh, GA next week. And I'll go over that. And also, I have here uh, Michael Priest, who's uh, also product manager and, and architect of uh, Docker Core uh, Runtime. And uh, he's going to be available to talk about uh, questions that come up. So my basic plan here is I'm going to present slides for probably 20-ish minutes or so. And then I just want to open it up to questions. And we can go in whatever direction people want to go in. And uh, Karen, can I ask you monitor uh, questions? Yeah. Is that, okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. All right. So let's jump in here. I'm going to present slides on what's new in Docker 112, and then I'll try to go a little deeper into technical detail. Uh, generally speaking, here's here's what's coming in in Docker 112, and also from Docker the company. Uh, we added orchestration in in the 112 release. So uh, this is a huge change for us. It's probably the biggest change in Docker uh, since in the Docker platform since we launched the original Docker back in 2013. Uh, what Fundamentally what orchestration means is that uh, whereas previously you would do a Docker run command, right? Everyone knows the command Docker run. Uh, it's a single container. Now we're adding a new command called Docker service, and that lets you manage a, a replicated set of containers uh, with desired versus actual state reconciliation for that service. Uh, I'll explain in a moment in more detail what, what that actually means. But so these new orchestration features, they're called swarm mode. We're, we're going to take a look at that, how to get into that mode. Um, once you're in that mode, you can use Docker services. We also did some really cool security stuff. Um, we have TLS mutual authentication, uh, TLS encryption. Uh, all of this happens out of the box by default. Uh, you can control it, but the default settings are it's secure out of the box, and that's something we're really proud of because no one else in orchestration is doing that right now. Uh, lastly, we have something called a routing mesh. Basically, it's uh, uh, a way uh, to expose your services, expose ports on your cluster to the outside world, and there's some clever tricks there that I'm, I'm going to talk about. Uh, I also want to mention uh, our Docker, um, Docker for X is what I've called it here. Basically, we're trying to have uh, prepackaged Docker for a number of different platforms to help people on those platforms get started. So if you want to use Docker on uh, your desktop, your Mac or Windows laptop, for example, uh, we now have an open public beta of Docker for Mac and Docker for Windows. Uh, anyone can sign up. I'll provide a link uh, later in the slide. We also introduced, and these are currently still in private beta, uh, Docker for AWS and Docker for Azure. Again, I'll give a link in a moment where you can uh, sign up if you want to participate in the private beta. But uh, fundamentally what these are, are um, uh, if you're familiar with AWS uh, CloudFormation templates, you know, this is a template that will kick off uh, a Docker Swarm cluster on AWS, and then uh, you, you don't have to do any configuration. You can control uh, the number of nodes and so forth, but you don't have to do any configuration. Uh, and then um, I'll mention a couple other new features in the engine we're excited about. Uh, one, uh, container health checks is something we've added, and we've also done some improvements to plugins. And uh, lastly, if there's time, I'll talk about the Docker, Docker application bundle, which is a new feature that we're introducing um, to ease the deployment of multiple services. So l let me go ahead and explain what swarm mode is. Um, so. Typically, you start with, let's say you have one machine, and it's running the Docker engine, it's running the Docker daemon that everyone knows, and you type Docker Swarm init. What that will do is put the machine into swarm mode, and that means that it can cluster with other engines that are also running in swarm mode. So next slide, you have a second machine now, and on that machine, you type Docker Swarm join, and you give it the IP of the first machine, the blue one. So now you have a two node cluster and you can repeat this process. If you have more engines, uh, you can join any number of engines to, to your cluster. Here I'm showing a total of six. 
And once you've done, uh, once you've created this cluster, you can use something called Docker services. So as I mentioned earlier, a Docker service is kind of, you could think of it as Docker services, the new Docker run. Uh, what, what, you, what happens when you start a service, and you'll see a command at the bottom of the slide here, I'm gonna walk through what it means, is uh, you, have, you have an image, if you look at the end of the command, you have some image called front end image. Uh, you could, but it could be anything. It could be Redis, colon, latest. It could be Nginx, whatever. You have some image, and you want to run three replicas of it, meaning three identical copies, on your cluster. Uh, you give them a name, and you assign them uh, an overlay network. In this case, I've called it MyNet. And lastly, you publish uh, port 80. So the assumption here is that this front end image is some type of web server, and it's listening on container port 80, and we want to map that through to, to uh, cluster port 80. I'll talk about cluster ports in a moment, but basically this is how you map your service uh, to the outside world. So we now have three uh, instances of our service. Let now, as you see on the next slide, you can start an additional service. Uh, in this case, I'm starting Redis. Again, I'm putting it on the same overlay network, and uh, I'm, since I'm not specifying a number of replicas, by default, it'll just maintain one, uh, one replica, one copy of Redis running. Uh, notice how we didn't do anything to, to tell the scheduler where to schedule these containers. It looked for where resources were available, and it chose those three green engines at the bottom. Um, now let's take a look at uh, what happens when a node fails, because this is where the real power of services starts to come in. So let's say that uh, one of the nodes fails. Uh, as you can see from the red X, uh, we're going to pick the node on the right that, uh, you know, it went down or the switch it's on, it went down, um, or, you know, whatever. And uh, so now that node is gone. Okay, so now we're in a situation where we requested three replicas of that black container, the, the one I'm calling front end image, and uh, one replica of Redis. So that's our desired state. We declared that earlier with those two commands I'm showing at the bottom. Those are the same two commands from before. So we initially declare that desired state, but the actual state shown in the diagram now is different from the desired state, right? There's only one copy of the black container when there should be three. So the scheduling machinery of, of Docker 112 is going to detect this divergence between desired and actual state, and it's going to try to, re to converge back to the original desired state. So in this case, it needs to start two more copies of the black, con the black container. Okay, boom, it did it. It scheduled them to those additional engines. Again, that was a decision made by the scheduler, but the point is it got three copies back up and running. So that's what we mean by desired versus actual state reconciliation. When you use the Docker service command, you're not just doing a one-shot operation like you do with Docker run. You're actually declaring a desired state for the cluster, and uh, the cluster will maintain that state until you give it a new desired state. So one example where you might give it a new desired state is if you want to scale. So we have uh, Docker service scale, uh, sub sub command and in this case I'm specifying the front end container I want six six replicas now previously we had three we we execute this command three new ones got scheduled now we have a total of six the black container uh, we also have something called global services so um, there's a lot of cases where you want to run um, the same program on every node in your cluster uh, like this would be common if you have some kind of an agent that you need on every machine. Uh, antivirus is another example. Some people have an antivirus daemon that they just, they want a, one copy on every machine. So uh, you can see the command syntax below. If you do a Docker service create, but you specify mode equals global, then you will get uh, the container in the blue container, which in this case is Prometheus, it's monitoring uh, container, scheduled once on every node. Now, I want to briefly mention constraints. Uh, people often say, hey, I have, a contain I have a service and I want to make sure that the containers for that service only get scheduled on uh, particular nodes. So in this case, uh, let's say the two green ones close to the right uh, have SSD drives. So when you start up the Docker daemon on those machines, you gave it a label uh, argument and you specified, okay, these machines have SSD drives. 
uh, com.example.storage equals SSD. Now you want to schedule your uh, container to only run on machines with SSD drives. So what I'm showing at the bottom is exactly the same command as before, except I've inserted the bold part. And the bold part is a constraint that specifies that the, that the, the replicas for this service should only run on machines that have uh, storage equals SSD. And as a result, the scheduler will only put containers for this service on those two machines. Now, what if you scale up? You'll see a new command at the bottom. Let's scale up to 10 instances. Still, it can only schedule to those two machines because of the constraint. So that the 10 instances will be split between those two, those two machines. Okay, so that was kind of a summary of uh, Docker 112 orchestration and uh, just showing you some of the commands uh, just, just to get a feel for what, what you can do and how you can do it. Um, obviously, we have more detailed documentation and, you know, you can also just play with these commands and, uh, you know, you can do Docker service dash dash help. It'll show you the, the subcommands for that. And um, so uh, what I wanted to do now is insert a little bit of an advertisement for how you can try Docker 112. Uh, currently, we're in the release candidate phase, which means that we've built all of these features into the Docker engine, but we're currently fixing bugs. And so what we're doing roughly every week is releasing a new release candidate. Um, and we're hoping to release the final GA version uh, uh, shortly, perhaps by the end of this month. Um, but in the meantime, what we have the, most, the latest right now is uh, Release Candidate 4. So how can you get it? Okay, if you're on Mac and Windows, you can get it from docker.com slash product slash docker. You just you navigate to that uh, URL and, and then you click Mac or Windows and it'll uh, give you the uh, Docker for Mac or Docker for Windows containing the latest RC. If you're on Linux, uh, my recommendation is you actually go to our GitHub the, the docker slash docker project and in the releases section you can download binaries for uh, RC4. Uh, you can also obviously download the source. Um, uh, what, if you're working in server environments though, what we actually recommend is the AWS and Azure editions. Now those are in private beta right now so I can't guarantee access to them but if you sign up on that link then uh, you'll be able to uh, get access to those, um, we, we just sort of go through the list and, in batches and and uh, invite, send out invites. So, um, of, of course, if you want the true bleeding edge, you can get the Docker master binaries from DockerProject.org. That's for sort of the most advanced users. And I'll also mention um, uh, my partner in crime, Andrea Lazardi, and uh, and I. He and I did a keynote speech at uh, DockerCon where we talked about some of the stuff I've just run through, but in a little more detail. So if you want to see that, it's uh, this this URL here, the YouTube URL. By the way, we'll make these slides available afterwards, so don't don't worry about trying to screenshot this. Um, I want to talk a little bit about some of the some of these other features that kind of go along with orchestration. So one of the things we're really proud of is uh, this secure by default architecture. Basically, when you form a cluster. Uh, with, with most systems, they'll communicate with each other in the clear, and they'll also trust each other sort of by default. If they're just setting up regular, you know, uh, TCP connections between nodes. What we're doing is different. Uh, we're, we're doing automatic encryption and automatic mutual auth between every node. And we're even going a step beyond that. Uh, certificate rotation, whenever you do anything with TLS, you have to think about certificate rotation. And um, in many cases, this is difficult to do. It's, it's just it's difficult to keep track of um, and know when to rotate certificates. Uh, we do this automatically on a schedule. And you can control that schedule. It, it has a reasonable default, but um, that's a built-in feature. Uh, we also support, I get asked this a lot, we also support integration with external CAs. So if you have some kind of an enterprise CA product and you want to use that, uh, you, you can have your certificates generated by that CA. If you don't have that, like if you have a simpler setup, uh, we'll, we'll generate self-signed certificate. We'll generate a self-signed root CA uh, for your cluster automatically, but you, you don't have to use that. Um, 
I want to clarify something that uh, sometimes comes up. These features I've just described, uh, Docker services, uh, Docker swarm mode, all of this is completely optional. If you don't ever enter swarm mode, meaning that you don't ever type Docker swarm init, you'll have uh, a Docker 112 engine that is completely backwards compatible. It works exactly the same way as Docker 111. So I mentioned this just because I don't want people to be concerned that if they upgrade, then suddenly you know, something's going to break. Uh, you, that's absolutely not the case. You, so it, it's safe to upgrade to 1.12 if, even if you don't want to use these features. Um, let me talk a little bit about this routing mesh concept because this is something we've done that is actually pretty cool. Uh, in the, when I was going through those slides in the beginning, I was talking a little bit about suppose you have a container. And by the way, the, the Docker service command from before is, is that's the, it's the same command as at the bottom of this slide, so just to refresh your memory. But what I was saying is, okay, so you have a Docker service command, you've declared three replicas, and they're, they're uh, exposing a port on the cluster. And in this example, uh, the port is 8080. It maps to container port 80. Uh, so again, imagine that the image is running some kind of web server on its port 80. We're, we're then going to map that through with the dash dash publish command, uh, sorry, dash dash publish flag uh, to cluster port 8080. So what does that mean? Well, that means that every node in the cluster is going to expose port 8080 and map it to this service. And so you can see here uh, in that little uh, uh, command line icon is supposed to represent a user uh, sitting in his or her web browser and uh, accessing port 8080 on one of the machines in your cluster. In this case, the, the request is going to worker two. In real life, uh, usually the browser would first go to some kind of a load balancing layer, an external load balancer, uh, like a NELB on Amazon or uh, an F5 in, in within Enterprise. Uh, but anyway, one way or another, the user is getting directed to port 8080 on Worker 2. And there's two instances of the front-end container on, on Worker 2. So great, uh, Worker 2 can service the request. And by the way, our routing mesh will handle that load balancing and deciding which instance of Worker 2 is, is uh, you know, has the least traffic and is available to uh, service the request. Now, here's, I'm going to go to the next slide, and here's what's really cool. Suppose that the user browser gets redirected to Worker 3. Worker 3 is not running any copies of the front end container, so it doesn't have the ability to just uh, route that through to one of its copies of, of the container and, and handle the request. But our routing mesh is smart enough to recognize that, and it, it will redirect the re request to one of the other workers that is running copies of the front end container. So in this diagram, what I've shown is it redirected to worker two. It could just as easily have been worker one. There's no particular significance to that. But the point is the routing mesh handles all this for you. So you can abstract away. You do, basically, you don't need to know what machines your container got scheduled on in order to publish a port. All you need to know is uh, port 8080 is open on every machine in the cluster, and you can send requests to port 8080 on any machine, and you don't have to worry about where the containers are actually running. And moreover, the scheduler, if one of the containers goes down, it may reschedule it to worker one, it may reschedule it to worker three, it doesn't matter. So that's something we're really excited about. Um, just looking at the bullets on the right at the bottom, you know, we also have built-in load balancing. So what happens is requests will round robin between those three instances of front end uh, to load balance traffic. And we also have DNS service discovery. Uh, this is something we've had in the past. We've expanded it a little bit. Um, but basically, you can, uh, within an overlay network, you can uh, do a, a lookup on the name front end uh, or front end .net, and you will get a virtual IP that routes traffic, a round robins traffic between one of those three front end instances. Okay, uh, briefly, I want to mention container health check. Uh, this is a new feature we have to the engine. Uh, you can put it in your Docker files. What, what it does is uh, if you declare this in your Docker file, it will specify uh, how, to, how to determine whether that container is healthy. And then the engine itself will periodically run your health check. So the syntax here, what I'm showing is um, 
a health check based on curl, right? You, the container is, let's say it's a web server, so you just want to curl localhost port 80 and see if it is successful. Uh, and if, if it is successful, it'll return an exit status of zero, which we consider to be a healthy container. If it's not successful, it'll return an exit status of one. Uh, that's the, the CMD parameter there. And uh, in that case, the container is unhealthy. Here we're specifying check every five minutes uh, that, the, that the container is working and uh, expect a request within three seconds. You can have up to three consecutive failures before the container is put in an unhealthy state. If the container is found to be in an unhealthy state, in, if you're in swarm mode, then the container will be killed and restarted on another node. Uh, if you're not in swarm mode, currently there's no default action. So again, this is about backwards compatibility. Like if you don't, you can uh, detect from, uh, I think it's from Docker PS, uh, but you can detect, or sorry, uh, Docker inspect, you can detect that the container is in an unhealthy state and you can choose to act on that, but uh, it, by default, outside of swarm mode, it won't, it won't do anything. Um, just really briefly, we added some new plugin subcommands. Um, this is an experimental feature in 112. Uh, but the basic idea is to try to make plugins a little bit more, uh, well, first off, e easier to install and also function a little bit more like a kind of a smartphone app store. So now what you can do is type Docker plugin install and the uh, Docker Hub uh, name of a plugin, and uh, that plugin will be installed on the machine automatically. You don't have to FCP any files around or anything like that. Uh, and then there's Docker plugin enable and disable once you have a plugin installed. Uh, the other cool thing about Docker plugin install is, and this is what I meant about something like a smartphone app store, is uh, the plugin itself has a manifest that declares what kind of permissions it needs. And then when you do a Docker plugin install, you'll be presented with that list of permissions. And you can you can either grant them or you cannot grant them. So in other words, you can you can see what is this plugin going to do, and is that okay with me? And if it's not okay, you press no. And if it's okay, you press yes. So try to make that, that simpler so that you have some uh, visibility into what a plugin is, is going to do if you allow it to install. Uh, this is a repeat of the previous slides. So I won't go over it again, but uh, this is how to try Docker 112. Uh, the other thing I want to talk about is um, the Docker 112 hackathon. So we've been running a, a hackathon for, it's an online hackathon, and we're trying to get people to submit cool hacks based on, on Docker 112. And uh, there, the submission deadline is coming up in five days. You can have a team of up to three people. There's some pretty cool prizes, as you can see on the slide. Um, yeah, I'd actually, I'd really like to have a 3D printer. So um, that, that looks pretty cool. But, um, you, you know, basically we're trying to get people to submit full hacks and, uh, you know, just play around with 112 and, and do interesting stuff with it. So there's a link at the bottom there that if you want to, uh, participate in that. We really hope people will. Uh, okay. Uh, at this point, I want to try to turn to questions. What what I found is most useful in these meetups is for me to not talk forever and instead to address audience questions. So let me figure out how to do that. Should I stop share? Oh, okay. okay. <coughs> Okay, um, so starting here, um, uh, Stefan's question, uh, will Docker Enterprise take advantage of Docker 112 orchestration soon? Uh, yes, the answer is yes. Um, so what's gonna happen is Docker Data Center, the, our enterprise product, is going to release a new version um, uh, shortly after 112, the open source 112 uh, becomes generally available, which we hope is in the next couple weeks. So I, I don't have um, DDC's timeline right in front of me, but basically the idea is the enterprise product will um, support these new features, at, but it, it will also continue to support existing, uh, you know, all of your existing apps. So it's, it's not like you have to um, embrace services all in one shot. Uh, okay, Tom's question. Uh, do you have HA features in the engine? Cool to have built-in LB, concern is single point of failure. Yeah, yeah, great question. Um, it's actually two questions. They're both great. Uh, so yeah, we do have HA features. Let me see if I can share again. 
Um, okay, yes. Yeah, so here's the deal. Uh, uh, nodes in a swarm have one of two roles. They can either be managers or workers. The managers are the ones that are responsible for the scheduling uh, and the ones that you issue commands to. The workers are just dumb uh, kind of drones that, that do whatever they're told to do. So, and these are all, these are all, just to clarify, these are all mach identical machines running Docker Engine. All, all we've done is tell some of them to be workers and some of them to be, uh, tell some of them to be managers, the blue ones, tell some of them to be workers. Um, now, let me go forward a little bit. The difference, what the slide you're looking at now is actually the same boxes as before. We've just uh, linearized it, we've classed it down and to try to show the difference between managers and workers. The managers all share an, an internal distributed state store, uh, which is, it's basically, it's a distributed database. It's based on Raft. Uh, the underlying implementation is derived from the etcd backend. So you don't have to run etcd, uh, but internally we have a distributed store and uh, those that's how those managers are sharing data. So as you can see here, I'm showing three managers. This is an HA configuration. If one of those managers goes down, the other two can survive just fine. And uh, so for real production deployments, you would likely want a topology like this, where you have three or even five managers. Uh, the case for five is usually that if you get page to 2 a.m., you, you can just shut off the page and go back to sleep because you ha have four uh, working managers remaining. And if you, if you get paged again, now you can you better go to work. But the, the, Cluster is still functioning, but you've got to bring them back up. You, you're down to three, so you need to uh, bring the other two back up. With with Raft and most of these consensus protocols, you need at least uh, N over two to be functioning correctly. So um, the answer is yes, uh, we do support HA. Now, your second question was about a uh, single point of failure. Um, uh, yeah, so let me go back to the load balancing slide for a moment. Um, the, the idea here is that what, what we're doing is using IP tables, rules, and IPVS on each machine to map port 8080 to one of the, one of the containers. So it's, there shouldn't be a single point of failure in this configuration. Like w the way you would architect this, and I probably need to make a better slide to show this, but uh, all of these machines would be fronted by some kind of a load balancer, like an external load balancer. Uh, Amazon ELB would be an example. And if one of the machines fails, the load balancer will detect that and it'll stop routing traffic to it. But the other machines are still capable of serving traffic on 8080. And the manager will also detect the failed node. And so it, it will not schedule any more containers to it. And if there's containers that were scheduled to it, it'll, it'll restart them on another node. Uh, okay, Stefan, can the container health check send email notifications or trigger an action in case it detects a failure? Oh, great question, great question. Uh, Currently, no, but I I think that would be a great feature. So this is our first foray into container health checks. Um, we're still, it's, it's actually still an active debate on GitHub about exactly uh, how it should work. And um, yeah, that's a great idea to bring into the discussion. Uh, okay. Okay. Oh, wow. Questions are coming faster than I can answer. Uh, wait, so which, where should I start? Um, let's start. Was that right here? Can you look for comments? Yeah. Uh, this one, yeah. Okay. do you have solutions for Docker OpenStack integration? Um, yeah. Uh, so all of this will run on OpenStack. We don't have specific integration. Maybe repeat the question. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, there was a question about uh, do we have solutions for Docker OpenStack integration? Uh, the answer is that uh, basically no, but it, this all should should run fine on OpenStack. Like we're we're completely platform agnostic, but we don't have specific solutions for that. Um, is there functionality in Docker? Is there functionality in Docker Machine to create clusters like this? Yeah, great question. Um, so you can use Docker Machine to provision Docker engines just like before. It won't automatically put them into swarm mode. So you'll you would need to SSH into the machine that you want to be the manager and do Docker Swarm init, and then into each of the workers and do Docker Swarm join. Um, again, that, that's why we're um, investing so much in these Docker additions, because that'll make it a lot easier to get a swarm out of the box. And again, that's, that's what's in private beta uh, right now. 
Um, how to run individual container the same way I can do in Swarm now with Docker H Swarm? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So Docker run. I wasn't able to do it, especially the publish all flag. I don't think the service is needed for individual container. Yeah, yeah. So if you just want to run an individual container, um, what what I would do is Docker service create replicas one, and then you'll get an individual container, but it'll be managed by the machinery of of Docker one twelve orchestration. Um, if you truly want to run a one-off container, a, an unmanaged container that is not part of any Docker service, then you can always still do a Docker run command like, like you did before. Like that, that'll continue to work. Um, can you tell more about ingress? Uh, yeah. Can you, sorry, uh, uh, Luke, can you be more specific about what, what else you want to know? Um, so basically, the idea with ingress is this routing mesh, it's the slide I'm showing right now where we expose uh, port 8080 on every machine. Um, if you have a more specific question, post it. Uh, okay. Um, so mesh routing will keep ports open only on the IP address that is indicated in listen address during join or on all IPs and all network interfaces. <laughs> Do you know the answer? I th I think I think the answer is all all interfaces, but I'm not, honestly not sure. Um, if you want to email me, my email is in these slides somewhere. If you want to email me, I can uh, get get an answer from that from an expert. Um, I'll put up a slide with my email. Okay. Does it allow exposing Docker containers directly to external clients? with not using port mapping or NAT? Uh, yeah, currently, no. So if you if you use a Docker service, uh, currently, y you, you can't bypass the routing mesh. It's something we're looking at. We'd like to see more use cases where people want to do it and try to understand wh why did they want to bypass the routing mesh. Um, so basically, it's something we're open to as a future feature if we see compelling, you know, user interest in it. Um, but we'd lo we'd love to learn more about uh, that use case. What will happen if the swarm manager fails? Does another node take over? Yeah, great question. Um, so let's go to one of these slides here. Um, so in in this slide, the blue it's uh, not indicated, but the blue uh, engine is considered to be the manager, and the green ones are workers. And uh, in this case, if the manager fails, uh, you, you won't be able to schedule any additional containers in the cluster. However, the containers that are running will still keep running, the routing mesh will still keep working, so it's up to you to reboot the blue engine. However, if you have multiple managers, and let me fast forward to a slide that shows that, so if you have three managers, now you're in an HA configuration. If one of those managers fails, it's okay, the other two can take over. So it really depends on how you set up your swarm. If you set it up with one manager, then you'll have a single point of failure. If you set it up with three, five, or seven, uh, and I don't recommend going beyond seven, I'll tell you why in a second, uh, but if you set it up with multiple managers, then you're in an HA configuration and uh, you can survive the loss of one or more managers. Uh, so I, I want to mention that uh, some people hear about multiple managers and uh, assume that that's a more scalable configuration, like sort of like the more nodes I have, the more managers I need. That's actually not what we recommend. What we recommend is uh, the more, basically the more managers you add, uh, the slower things are going to get. So the most performant configuration is one manager, and three is fine too, and five is fine. I'd be really reluctant to go beyond five. Um, I would say put pack those managers with as much as much CPU and as much hardware as you can and try to keep it at the minimum number that you need to satisfy your HA requirements, which might be three or five. And for whatever it's worth, I've seen uh, w household name companies running their data centers with just, just five managers. And th these are data centers with, I don't know, 10,000 machines or something. I mean, huge numbers of machines and they service them all with just five five managers. So, um, yeah, I just warn you against against that kind of reasoning. Uh, what about composing complex applications which require different services running in different Docker containers but treat the whole thing as a single app? Yeah, great question. Great question. Um, 
So this gets into something called distributed application bundles or DAB files. So let me start at the beginning. Um, right now we have a tool called Docker Compose, and it's pretty well known, so I'm guessing that people uh, on this have heard of it, but Docker Compose lets you declare a set of services that uh, together comprise your application. And uh, the Achilles heel of the current Docker Compose is that it's completely a client-side tool. So if you declare uh, five web containers and two Redis containers or whatever, then you, you do Docker Compose up, those get deployed, and then Docker Compose has no way of knowing if they stay running. So if a node goes down, Compose can't recover from that because it was just a one-shot command line tool. So what we're doing in 112, and this is an experimental feature, this is something that's going to be evolving in uh, over the course of 112 and 113, the September release, is uh, a new file format called uh, distributed application bundles. And these bundles uh, are probably will be generated from Compose files, so you can still use the familiar Compose syntax. But what a DAB file will do is declare multiple services and give you a redistributable artifact. Uh, right now it's JSON. It may become a binary artifact in the future. But a redistributable artifact that describes all of the services in your applications and the interconnections between them. And a big part of the motivation for this is that we want uh, to have an artifact. That you, we want to allow a workflow where you can develop on your laptop using Compose. And um, when you're satisfied with your application, you generate this DAB file. And then you uh, pu push the DAB file to the server. Probably in the future, you'll be able to push it to, to the, uh, your Docker registry or, or Docker hub. And um, then you can run the same DAB file on the server that you did on your laptop. So this area, honestly, is, it's a work in progress for us. It's an experimental feature, which means we'll probably break the file format in 113. But our plan is to GA this in 113. It's we're, we really think there's a need for a multi-container, uh, uh, sort of what I would call a multi-image image format. And um, we're we're experimenting and getting feedback on GitHub about what uh, what the best way to do that is. Uh, in your route mesh slide, after failures happened on some nodes and containers were moved to other nodes, how does port, how does port mapping in this scenario? Say one node may have two containers in the same service. Uh, yeah. So okay, let's go back to the slide. Okay, so I, I think what you're asking is uh, basically suppose that worker two failed um, and it has two instances of front end. So where would they go? Uh, and the answer is it's up to the scheduler and the manager. But in in the diagram here, presumably, it, since worker two is gone, it would assign uh, at least one container to worker three and then one container to worker one, since the, those are those the only two nodes remaining. But it doesn't affect ingress. It doesn't affect uh, the port mapping because every node is exposing port 8080 and regardless of how many containers that node is running, it knows about, uh, it knows that port 8080 needs to map to this service and it will internally, uh, what will happen is traffic will come in on 8080, it will be round robin between the three virtual IPs uh, of the containers that, that in the scenario you described would now be scheduled on worker one and worker three and uh, just to be clear, that, that round robining is happening at, at the virtual IP level, the VIP level. Uh, it's not, not to be confused with DNS round robin, which has a, a ton of limitations. And uh, it's appropriate in some cases, but it's not the best way to do load balancing. But that's, that's not what we're talking about. Uh, traffic would be round robin between the three containers. It doesn't matter where, they, where they've been scheduled or rescheduled. OK, uh, can you please talk about more about service discovery? How is the worker three able to redirect to worker two in the example you've shown? Is there uh, an LB service discovery agent running in each host? How do they synchronize service info among each other? Okay, wait, all great questions. Um, let me let me start with, so there's, there is no agent. There's only the Docker engine. And the Docker engine itself is what's managing uh, all of this. Uh, uh, rerouting of traffic, and it's doing it by going and talking to the kernel, 
uh, via IP tables rules and talking to the kernel also via IPVS, which is a uh, Linux technology IP virtual server. It's it's pretty cool actually. If you're into networking, you, sh you should look it up. It's it's really cool. But um, that's how the traffic routing is working. There's no agent. There's no user space agent that all of the packets are flowing through. Um, we've seen other systems attempt to do traffic routing in user space, and the performance is terrible. But when you do it in kernel space, performance is excellent. So uh, let me try to tackle some of the other parts of your question. Um, sir, uh, talk more about service discovery. So I don't have a good slide on this, um, uh, in this deck at least, but basically um, what will happen when you, so if you look at the bottom of this slide, you see the command I've been referring to kind of throughout this, this presentation, Docker service create, three replicas, call, call them front end, put them on an overlay network called MindNet. And uh, that, by doing that, the DNS name front end will resolve to a virtual IP uh, that is a, uh, th that is itself a uh, load balancer for the three containers, an internal load balancer. So when you, uh, in your application, let's say you want to reach front end uh, from so some other code in your application, you do a, a DNS resolution on front end and you'll get back, you know, 10.0.0.5. And then uh, th that, uh, any traffic sent to 10.0.0.5 will be load balanced between these three containers, which themselves will have different addresses. They might have dot six, dot seven, dot eight. Um, I'm sorry I don't have a slide to make this clearer. It's, it's a lot easier to see in a diagram, but uh, that, that's how service discovery and internal load balancing works. In the same vein, how can you debug a messed up container while still taking it out of being uh, served traffic? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I would take the node offline. Do you have a suggestion? I would take the I would take the node out of the cluster, uh, so you can do a Docker node pause, and uh, that will prevent new anything new from being scheduled. And then you could uh, diagnose and debug it. Yeah, that would also affect all the containers in that node, which is a bit unfortunate. But it's true. Although all that would happen is those other containers on the node would be rescheduled elsewhere in the cluster automatically. So, yeah. Um, yeah, that, that's that's the answer I have. I, I do I do in general. Um, I just will mention that people ask me a lot about scenarios where a container failed and they they don't want it to just be killed. They want to leave it around so they can debug it. So I mean th that is something where I want to add better support in future versions. Um, but right now, what I would recommend is disconnecting the node from the swarm, and then you can uh, study containers on it independently. Um, how if you have uh, sorry, how if you have two services that supposed to run on port 80, example API, and web app uh, on examples you use uh, to map port container to host cluster, how can I archive two services on the same port? Okay, so two, two sorry, I, I don't, I'm not sure I'm totally following the question. Um, two services on the same port, uh, it's not possible. Once you declare a service on, once you map a service through, once you publish it on port 8080, that port is locked up on every machine in the cluster. You can't have another service on port 8080. But so, so what you could do is set up your own Nginx and then add load balance between, oh, sorry, uh, to um, host database. Uh, yeah, yeah, yes, virtual host. Yeah, 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 that's a good point. So what one thing you could do in that situation is run uh, a, a, an Nginx or an HA proxy service and it would just be a URL routing service. Basically, it's like a layer seven load balancer. And so you could have uh, 50 different domains all published on port 80 of your cluster. And uh, that initial service would handle the uh, routing. And then the those 50 different applic applications would um, ha expose only internal ports, which the HA proxy or Nginx would know how to reach. So that's what I do in that situation. Uh, how can volume be migrated alongside services when a node fails? Yeah, yeah, excellent, excellent question. Um, currently, what I'm going to recommend is, um, 
So you're going to need to use a volume driver that knows how to move volumes around um, as containers get rescheduled. What I would recommend is either, and, and this is not coming from some kind of uh, vendor partnership or anything, this is just honestly my own experience with other people's open source, I would recommend either EMC RexRay, uh, <clears throat> REX-Ray, it's an, it's an open source project, or uh, Flocker. And um, both of these are open source, you can check them out. They're designed so that you can have a named volume, and if a container dies and moves somewhere else, that named volume will follow the container. Um, they're both really cool. They Each one has its pros and cons, which I don't have time to get into right now, but I would check those out. Is there ever a need to start multiple managers if you have at least three nodes? Uh, okay, so I don't. Okay, I don't totally follow the question. The 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 only reason you would ever start multiple managers is if you want a high availability configuration where you can tolerate the loss of one or more managers and uh, not you know not have to get paged and, and go into work or whatever in the middle of the night. That, that's why you would have more than one manager. If you have a three node cluster, you could make every machine a manager and a worker, and then you'll have uh, you'll have HA and you'll be able to schedule containers on the same machines. Um, the other thing you could do in a three node cluster, I mean, that's a small cluster, so it may be internal like a, a dev or test cluster. In that case, I would just run one manager and I'd use the other two machines entirely for uh, scheduling uh, uh, service uh, tasks. Okay. Um, okay, LB makes sense. Why would I use both ELB and LB in the engine? Seems redundant. Oh, yeah, yeah, great question, great question. Um, okay, so the, the LB that I've described is, is internal load balancing. The virtual IP stuff is internal load balancing. So there's three instances of the front end container. They're all fronted by a single internal IP, meaning um, uh, an overlay IP that's only visible uh, on that overlay network. So the way that we expose ports, and the diagram that is up on the screen right now is, is the relevant one here. The way that we expose ports is we uh, map a service through to, to the port 8080 on every machine in the cluster. So if you want external traffic to be, if you want to send all of your external traffic to worker three, then just give it a public IP and uh, that will work. Um, However, uh, worker three is just going to keep sending traffic to the other ones. It will load balance, um, but you may get better performance if you split the traffic amongst the four different machines here, the three green ones and the manager. Um, and to do that, you would set up uh, an external LB like a ELB. And um, so that, that's where uh, ELB would come in. The other thing I would say is a lot of people uh, who are on um, a particular IaaS, uh, like, you know, I'm just using Amazon as an example, often they want to use the the vendor provided, so in this case the Amazon provided load balancer. Um, there's advantages to using the, the what the vendor recommends for load balancing. Um, and you also see this in enterprise, too, where people have uh, – so an F5 or, or multiple F5s, and they really want to use that for load balancing because it gives them some um, benefits that that they won't get um, from our load balancing, which is, is simpler. So uh, Avi Networks product is another interesting example here. That's a, that's a startup out here in, in the Bay Area. Um, they do cool load balancing stuff. So um, yeah, the other answer to your question is just some people really want to use the vendor, the infrastructure provided load balancer. How are data volumes handled when containers are moved across nodes, especially when those nodes, when those are persistent volumes? Yeah, uh, that was the, that's the same as the question I answered previously. Basically, um, I would recommend using Flocker or Rexray, and if you do that, you will get uh, persistent volumes that can move across nodes, and you, you'll be able to run a database, and you won't lose your um, you won't lose your data if, if a node goes down. Is the DAB file data stored in the key value store? Uh, yeah, great question. The answer is no. So right now, DAB files are entirely client side. Um, it, the, the, when you deploy a DAB file, um, it will 
declare a desired state, which is maintained in the RAF uh, consensus group, the RAF quorum, but uh, the DAB file itself is is not um, not stored in the engine. It's just used to start up the services. So a DAB file right now is equivalent to just typing Docker service create, you know, three times or however many services you declare in the DAB file. Uh, we're looking at moving it to the the engine uh, to the to the manager side, but that's uh, again, that's an area of kind of kind of open discussion right now. Uh, it's it's uh, 9:57 a.m. in in my time zone, so I'm going to take one more question. Okay. Uh, do we still need to configure all the host OS limits, or does Docker Engine optimize everything to best known values? Uh, that is, max open file pointers, or top backlog, or number of listen sockets, uh, or number of incoming connection on IPv4. Uh, for example, um, I basically I I don't know. I mean I think we try. We, I don't believe Docker ever does the equivalent of a, of a u limit command. Is that do you know if that's correct? Yes. <clears throat> so for uh, Docker for Mac and Windows, and also the new Docker for AWS and Azure, we. We, we try to set up the Linux that we deploy there with reasonable defaults. But if you install Docker yourself using uh, RPM or uh, whatever, then then the, the host Linux setting is, is up to you. All right. Um, thank you very much, everyone. I know I didn't get to all the questions. Um, we will post these slides. Where will we post them? On the Meetup page? Yes, the Meetup page. Okay. The message out. Okay, so we will post these slides on the Meetup page. Uh, if you go through the slides, you can find my email address. Feel free to contact me. Uh, you know, I, I really want to help people get going with 112 and, and work with it. So, um, yeah, absolutely reach out to me. And um, there's also a lot of good information on GitHub, and I can also direct you to other, you know, other good resources. So thank you to everyone who joined. Uh, I really enjoyed uh, chatting with, with you this morning, and uh, have a good day.